much into the wind I want. I want to be with you. What do you say? I have cancer. I'm sorry, what? I'm sick. What's happening? Bye. What Wait, did I say? I didn't mean that. Just kidding. I don't have cancer. Let's go smash something. Love and Thunder marks the fourth entry in the Thor saga, in which Thor has to reunite with his recently buffed up ex-girlfriend Jane Foster to take on the MCU's widest villain yet, the evil Gore, a broken father who seeks the infinity gauntlet of uh, the eternity to eradicate half of life, uh, to eradicate all gods. And right away, I wanna address the giant goat in the room, which is that this is my second negative MCU video in a row. <laughs> So to ease any unsampled tension, I do want to make it clear that there are positives here as well. The inclusion of a sick Jane Foster and the thematic storyline of Thor allowing himself to fall for her once more even though he's gonna lose her, that is no sarcasm some of the strongest emotion the MCU has dealt with if you don't count the entries with Captain America. And in addition to that, this movie all around is full of great Marvel stuff which really showcases why armies of superfans online are fighting all MCU criticism as if their own lives depended on it. And I love all that stuff too. I love how a lot of the jokes here are recycled from last time so that we get to laugh at them twice. I love how the verbal exposition here never ends. I love how powerful the stakes feel at the end when we're watching little girls demolish a bunch of CGI monstrosities. I love how all the CGI here follows the usual MCU standards, all thanks to the way Marvel treats the digital artists they hire. I love how half of this movie is characters just standing around being quirky. A hand grenade? No, it's a portable speaker. I mean, a portion of this movie plays in all black and white. If that doesn't disprove the jealous allegations that Marvel isn't super smart art house cinema, I don't know what will. I am affected by this film. The camera work is amazing. The actors are terrific. Great editing and that sort of thing. I think ultimately it's cinema. <laughs> But all those positives aside, even though overall Love and Thunder is another 10 out of 10, I would argue that there is one negative aspect here as well. A cancer that has existed in the MCU since the very start. The villain. See, even though we have arguably the biggest acting talent in the MCU so far, Gore just ends up being another letdown that you're gonna forget just as quickly as all the other villains you already forgot. It's as if Marvel is incapable of featuring villains that will stand the test of time unless they have half a decade to build them up. So today, let's focus on that. We already touched on this topic before, but since MCU villains are a gift that keeps on giving, here's a couple more villain pitfalls to avoid when creating your own villain. The first big villain issue here is that Gore's ultimate goal lacks a way for him to continuously progress toward it, which makes him a weak villain. Essentially, Gore is a god-serving father who loses everything because the god he prays to doesn't actually care. Stupid. Which then leads to him being corrupted by this magical shadow sword and him killing his god, after which his main objective becomes... So this is my vow. All gods will die. And when we then go to Thor, we learn that killing gods is what Gore has been up to. We hear that these funny blue aliens lost their gods. And our gods were murdered. We see a bunch of distress calls about gods having a bad time all around. God That's a warning. Which means that Gore has been steadily progressing toward fulfilling his ultimate goal like a strong opposing force should. Except for the fact that the movie still hasn't established the logistics of how many guys actually need to be killed or what the end game way of doing so is, but never mind that for now. The important thing to notice happens when Gore soon shows up to Asgard, Asgard. <laughs> to kill Thor and take his axe, which we later learn he needs to unlock this galactic wishing well to wish away all the gods. And he actually handles himself very well. He overpowers Thor and has him at the mercy of a killing blow. And then he does what he came to do. He kills Thor, he takes his axe, and he teleports away to fulfill his goal exactly as strong villains do. All gods will die. <laughs> Except, oh wait, that's not actually what happens. Instead of killing Thor like the other gods before and taking his axe to do what he came to do, Gore starts exchanging quips. This is going to hurt. Pain. 
What is pain that... And waiting long enough for Thor to escape his grip and for the other heroes to show up to help. And then, because Skor apparently can't fight them all, he runs away with a bunch of kids with the aim that Thor will have to chase after him for another fight. And the issue you're seeing here is that all of a sudden, Gore doesn't push toward fulfilling his main goal, because that goal has been constructed in a way that if he did, the movie would just end 30 minutes in. Instead, he fights Thor again an hour later to try to do the exact same thing he could have already done in the beginning. In other words, Gore is less of a strong active villain pushing the plot and more of a weak construct of the plot that does things only when it fits the plot. And before you call me an overly nitpicky internet movie tuber of the 2020s, this is something that Sergio Leone was addressing five decades ago. Hey, is that the Necro Sword? That's cool, I've only ever read about it in stories. And you know, this is going to hurt. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Essentially, it's the exact same issue as in Doctor Strange 2. Wanda's ultimate goal was to find America Chavez and drain her powers, and when she could have just done it in the first act, she stopped to idle around instead, so the movie could go on for another 90 minutes. Every night, the same dream. Fight! Oh, f and so, when you're constructing your villain goal, you have to do it in a checkpoint kind of way to allow the villain to always progress toward it like a real force. Thanos isn't trying to find the Infinity Gauntlet, but instead five stones for it, which you can always actively do. <laughs> The Joker's plan involves multiple tiny pieces to assemble a grand masterpiece, which he's doing even when we think he isn't. Hello there. And it's that checkpoint mentality that you should have created for Gore as well. Maybe he kills specific gods at the start because that for some reason is his only way of finding Thor. Thor, they were your friends. You have to stop hiding here and go back out into the world. Maybe he doesn't kill Thor because he actually needs him for something. Maybe his whole plan is about manipulating Thor to go to the planet of the gods to get something that he himself needs to fulfill his goal and couldn't otherwise get. The Thunderbolt is the key. And then maybe at the end, it becomes clear that every action Gore has made brought him one step closer to where he's going. Now, you have an active villain force instead of a construct of the plot that doesn't do much of anything until the plot finally allows it. As one more different kind of example to make this very clear, it's essentially like this. Let's say that Gore's main goal is to learn a language, to learn Spanish, so that he can watch and support my Spanish channel as well. What you can't do is just present this goal and then have Gore do nothing about it until at the end where he suddenly speaks Spanish. No, you have to create checkpoints for him to progress through. He chooses an easy to use app that teaches Spanish. He uses the app to do a couple 10 minute fun interactive lessons each day. He starts getting better and expands into all kinds of lessons from games to videos. And and after three weeks of this, he's able to have a conversation in Spanish. We chickens to Morden, our Morads. Which makes it clear that he's that much closer to fulfilling his goal. That's what I mean. Oh, and if you want to learn the language on the side too, the app is called Babbel. They teach you through a variety of efficient and non-boring hands-on methods, which are designed by real language teachers to get you talking in just three weeks. Yo mismo la usara para aprender español y es realmente fácil y efectiva. More bien. They're sponsoring a 60% Filmento discount with the link below right now even after lifetime subscription, so what's the language you want to learn? Check it out. The second big villain problem here is that Gore doesn't remain faithful to his own core beliefs and motives, which makes him very two-dimensional. Again, Gore at his very core is a father who has to endure the thing that no father should when he loses his daughter. And because that loss was the fault of a god who never actually cared about anyone but himself, coupled with the fact that Gore becomes corrupted by this magical sword, it gives him a driving motive of vengeance. Kill all gods for being selfish murderers. But as I mentioned, Gore then immediately does something that in this context is very weird. He kidnaps a bunch of children from their homes and families. He torments those children like a sick high school bully. He lets those children be crushed to death had it not been for someone else. He even sends his army of CGI monstrosities to kill the kids. And when you contrast all that with a character motive driven by the loss of a child, the character very quickly becomes one big contradiction. In time. And the contradiction itself isn't bad. It can actually be powerful to see a villain get so lost in their hatred and pain that they become the thing they sought to destroy. But that requires a couple things, which in this movie are missing. Firstly, the contradiction has to serve the motive. Gore can't just bully the kids and laugh at their torment. What a neat 
story. It has to be more about him doing what in his mind is best for the kids. Him trying to convert them against gods because gods are evil. Him trying to help them at any cost in a way that he couldn't help his daughter. Whereas him just being like, oh, so you like gods, kids? Well, f you go ahead and die. That's not really in line with or in service of his core motive. Thor is on his way. The same axe was used to cut off Thanos' head. Yeah. Oh, good for you. Think for one f***ing second. What the f*** are you doing? And secondly, the contradiction has to be acknowledged. Gore can't just let the kids be crushed and try to kill them as if it makes no difference to him. It has to be more about him making those tough choices. Him forcing himself to focus on the mission instead of saving the kids because his hatred of the gods now outweighs the thing he's fighting for. Him forcing himself to unleash his CGI monstrosities on Thor and the kids despite how much he doesn't want to. Whereas him not even realizing that the kids are about to be crushed and him just seeking his monsters on the kids in a wide shot without any kind of emotional choice whatsoever, no. I mean, at the end, the movie makes this big deal about Gore redeeming himself, because deep down, he's just a father destroyed by the loss of his child. What kind of father would I be if I stopped? I'm dying. She would have no one. She would be alone. All while completely ignoring the fact that he literally just kidnapped a bunch of children and tried to kill them. Not a single acknowledgement where it'd be like, oh my god, what did I do? No, the movie just disregards all that as if it never happened. What a neat story! The reason Thanos seems like a real person is because he is the hero of his own story. He genuinely believes that he's in the right by snapping away half of life. The Joker as well, he's a messed up guy who just wants to prove that he's not alone, that behind the facades and masks that people put up, everyone's just as messed up as him. And when he's finally confronted with the idea that he might not actually be in the right here, What were you trying to prove? That deep down, everyone's as ugly as you, you're alone. You can feel him struggling with it because it just doesn't compute with what he believes. Whereas a villain who just does bad things because he's the villain and he's corrupted by this magical MacGuffin without any kind of justification or acknowledgement of what he does, that's not a person the audience can invest in. That's a basic two-dimensional movie bad guy that's there just to be defeated and never to be given a second thought again. The third big villain problem here is that Gore's entire existence is much more about the stuff around him rather than him as a character. First off, his motivation isn't even fully his own. He initially has a strong reason to seek vengeance against this god because that god's indifference took everything from him, but then it just instantly kills him. And suddenly his motive becomes more about the sword corrupting him to kill all gods because they're all the same, which lacks that initial directness. The motivation is there, but imagine if in Civil War Tony Stark just immediately dealt with Bucky and then then attacks the Rogers for being friends with Bucky. He's my friend. What a neat story! It's just not on the same emotional level. And so here, what if you kept that directness? What if Gore doesn't manage to kill his god in the beginning and instead the whole movie becomes about him hunting the god down at any cost to get his vengeance, which includes smashing through all other gods standing in the way, like Thor. Where are they? Someone knows where he is! Now it's much more about the Gore's motivation rather than the sword that corrupts him. Secondly, Gore's effects on the plot and other characters are never about him. When Gore kidnaps the kids and runs off into the Shadow Realm, the heroes decide that they can't just go after him because his shadow powers probably make him too powerful in the Shadow Realm. Goes through shadows and he's going to the Shadow Realm. You're right, we can't just go marching in there. When the heroes are trying to get Zeus's help, Zeus is too afraid to help because the magical sword that Gore carries can kill him. It's the Necro Sword, which means he could kill us. Not good. The whole big external reason we need to stop Gore is because there's this magical wishing well that he's gonna walk up to to use. What do you think a guy called the God Butcher would wish for? You know, it's never about Gore's actions. It's not about seeing him wield this sword in a unique way to take down this giant god that nobody thought could be defeated. It's not about seeing him use these toxic gifts in such a special way that it makes him specifically an incredible threat. No, he just swings the sword and unleashes CGI monsters in a way that literally anybody in his position could could have, and apparently gods have died in the process. So, you know, uh oh. Thirdly, and most importantly, Gore as a person just gets lost under all this sh from the makeup to the CGI powers. Like, who is Gore? What is it that makes him a great villain? Is he smart? Is he relentless? Is he invisible? Is he shameless? What is required from him as a person? I don't know.
All I do know is that he looks creepy, he can summon CGI monstrosities, he can use shadows as weapons, he wields a magical sword that apparently gives him power and immunity to all pain and injuries. Oh, good for you! And how was it? I hope it was f***ing good because it's useless now, isn't it? I mean, the reason it doesn't help to have a master chameleon actor like Christian Bell here is because there's nothing special about this character for him to pull from. He's like a chameleon without a background. All he can do is rely on his CGI abilities looking cool and look at his creepy makeup in the mirror and then launch into crazy mood swings that just come off as a poor rendition of the Joker. Are you a Valkyrie? Yes. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? And if Christian Bale couldn't pull this villain off, just imagine what would have happened with an actor that isn't Christian Bale. <laughs> I think the main point here is that Marvel has got to stop over relying on all this sh**. All these magical MacGuffins that make characters evil, all these ugly CGI monstrosities that artists are losing their health and sanity over, all these world and galaxy ending threats from dragons to infinity stone ripoffs to flying spy bases to whatever this is, you're just getting lost in the noise. Infinity War was awesome, but it can't be that all the time. How about you try to make a movie with less CGI for a change and see what happens? Because still to this day, the absolute best that the MCU has ever been is when it's just three people in an empty room.